Okay, class. So in the final part of this lecture, we're going to cover screening recommendations for the athlete. Um, so the AHA has a 14-point questionnaire that they recommend that athletes between the ages 12 to 25 uh, answer prior to participation. So um, they're all related to some of the key conditions that you know we've discussed in this lecture. So you know anyone re you know reporting unexplained syncope. Do they have a murmur, right? So it's part of its physical exam, part of its family history, part of its personal history. So again, structuring the examination or the screening around what we know to be you know, common signs and symptoms and risk factors for sudden cardiac death or the conditions uh, that are more related to sudden cardiac death, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and uh, coronary anomalies, but specifically hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in, in um, Marfan syndrome too. The AHA does not support the usage of mass ECG screenings, right? They cite costs, logistics, the relatively low incidence of, uh, of cardiac defects or sudden cardiac death in the athlete. Again, depending on the source, you know, this is kind of in dispute, um, as well as type 1 errors or false positives, right? Because if you potentially screen an athlete positive on an ECG, uh, you may end up precluding them from participating in sports, and you know, that has other consequences too, right? So sports are really important for, obviously, physical activity, but the mental well-being of the athlete, perhaps they're trying to get a scholarship, or there, there's other ramifications we always have to weigh when we're deciding to you know, implement any screening um, or any, any decision for, for a patient, and, and importantly, for an athlete. So um, we'll get into this in a little bit. Now, there is some controversy because uh, in Italy... Uh, they uh, have been screening athletes for the better part, I think, of about 40, almost 40 years. Um, it started, I believe, in I think Scalvini in Italy, um, where they do a 12-lead ECG in a, in a limited stress test um, on every single athlete that kind of comes through their doors. And they've noticed a pretty significant reduction in the incidence rates of, uh, of sudden cardiac death. The IOC actually recommends all and mandates that all athletes participating in the Olympics receive medical screening and a baseline ECG. And if you look at every single major professional sports league in North America, right, um, you know, baseball and all those different levels, football and all those different levels, basketball, all of them require pre-draft um, uh, pre testing with ECGs. The NBA is actually the most rigorous. I think they get a full uh, uh, CT scan or CAT scan before participating as well. So we, we implement these things, we mandate these things in you know the highest levels of sports. Um, obviously the different finances available you know at these levels and you have sports you know specific and specialized clinicians, but it just you know it always seems a little bit interesting and maybe a little bit concerning that we reserve this for, you know, you know, our professional athletes, but we don't do this for, for kids, right? In high school, the AHA, again, only recommends uh, screening. They do not require it either, right? So they don't even, you know, of course, they, they don't recommend or require ECGs, but even the AHA screening form, right? Like it's, it's just recommended. It's not mandatory in the um, in the United States, and if you if you screen or pull a number of athletes, myself included, like you get a pre you know sport physical, but very rarely do you get a very thorough um, examination prior to sports. Like I, I can recall myself, and I, I played collegiate sports too. So um, and when we got there, things were a little bit more um, you know I probably had our we got all school once once a year, but. Um, even at, at, in college, these things uh, slipped through the roof. There was a, there was a famous athlete uh, for Penn State, Journey Brown, um, who was, you know, set to probably be a first round draft pick, played, you know, two or three full seasons in college. And uh, only because of the extensive cardiac screening that they were doing in uh, response to the COVID pandemic, did they notice that he had uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? He actually played a couple seasons with, without people knowing. And, and, and fortunately, he, he had survived, um, but it, there was a chance that, I mean, he could have gone into an event and, and there, were, there would have been um, 
you know, a, a, a tragedy. And fortunately, they were able to screen, um, you know, this in, in response to the pandemic. So uh, just some some tips here or some some insights here. So about ECG screening, ECGs are abnormal in 90% of patients or over 90% of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in youth athletes. Again, this is not recommending, we're not discussing this for the older athlete or anyone over the age of 35. And then we're finding that advanced interpretation, because there are some abnormal but benign changes that happen in response to participation in sports or routine exercise. So we'll talk about the site, site uh, so the criteria in a bit. Again, a lot of these countries where it is mandatory, there is a single payer healthcare system. So the government is supplementing basically the, the cost for these uh, procedures, a little different in the United States where we're still a private insurance uh, primarily. Uh, so the Seattle criteria, Dresner et al., um, who I believe now is a current editor-in-chief of BGSM when this was published uh, now almost eight years ago, uh, published uh, these criteria that, again, these are abnormal, right, across the population, but normal, right, normal in an athlete. So again, like a little sinus arrhythmia, sinus bradycardia, not too uncommon, uh, especially the heart rate still above 30. But even like a Mobitz 1 or a type 1 AV no block in an athlete, like for for your family care physician, like who probably doesn't read ECGs too often, if they see that, they might be a little bit concerned, but we're learning that's not super concerning in an athlete, right? Um, so they're you know, common re related changes in an athlete. Um, and we're finding if we use this criteria, it actually reduces the false positive rate, which was actually is pretty high at 17% to about 4%, right? So that's pretty good, right? And again, even if an athlete screens positive, they'll go through further workup too. So there's a growing argument for the use of this advanced criteria, educating primary care providers so they know how to interpret these things at the community level in the family family practice clinics. So again, just a summary of what we see around the world. Again, in Italy, you know, that's you know, they started in the 80s. Now it's mandatory. They have you know history, ECG, and exercise tests. They have these four specific physician, um, and they saw a reduction, right, in sudden cardiac death. Now, there's some arguments about when they started, because there were some uh, reports that, the, that there was a high rate or high incidence rate of sudden cardiac death prior to the initiation of this uh, procedures, which may influence the improvements that they actually saw. So there's that's still kind of in debate. And the United States, again, like, you know, you know, we only recommend, but we see no decrease. However, in other countries, in Israel, they also make it mandatory, right? the same exact procedures really as Italy, and they haven't seen any decrease. So this is a, a hotly dis debated topic. This is still going on. This was going on in, as a debate when I was in PT school. It was a debate when I was in residency, and it probably will be going forward. But it's, it's something to be aware of. If you want to be working in, a, in an athletic setting, in a sports setting, you know, the cardiac screening should be a component of it, and you, you need to be familiar with these, um, you know, these, these discussions. And again, for the older athlete, um, you know, or just a general population, these are the recommendations we see coming out of the ACSM about, you know, again, if someone's got, even if they have some, um, you know, risk factors and it's known, even if they aren't participating in regular exercise, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll recommend clearance, and it could just be just guidance. Um, but if they do participate in regular exercise, even if they have no, even if they have, um, you know, some, you know, conditions and they're asymptomatic, um, they don't recommend clearance, right? Like they can start on a low routine, like a low intensity routine and build up, um, you know, be progressive. Um, anyone who's symptomatic, yeah, probably recommend medical clearance and a further workup. But again, even if you have risk factors, right, and you, you know you are, you know and asymptomatic, right, you got some hypertension, maybe not critical hypertension, maybe you're obese, maybe you have diabetes, not having major symptoms, especially during exercise, like you can probably proceed with low intensity and keep keep building up. So in summary, the recommendations for PTs is you know recreational athletes generally at low risk. Um, but it increases with more uncontrolled risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, all those things we talk about, physical inactivity being one of them. 
The risk of adverse events during an exercise decreases with the frequency and volume of exercise. So if you are consistent, even if you have some risk factors, we can mitigate your risk of having an acute event. Um, for someone who's never exercised before, recommend starting low, walking to tolerance, like, like below three med intensity. Take vitals in every patient. Use manual pulse rate to check for arrhythmias. Auscultate patients for murmurs. Report any undiagnosed findings to your PCP, just like we do with every patient. For youth athletes, consider using that 14-point questionnaire. That's the AHA's recommendations. Older adults, you know, there's other forms out there, the PARQ, ACSM, pre-activity screen, again, just to have a systematic way to, to mitigate and screen for risk. And they consider doing a submax exercise test to see how they respond physiologically to the acute stress of exercise. And that way you can even prescribe a, uh, an appropriate exercise um, uh, routine for that patient. And then making sure in your facility, right, especially if you're going to work with athletes, and I've screened, or I've surveyed the profession, uh, not everyone has defibrillators in their physical therapy clinic, which is kind of wild to think about. Like, you're going to have patients exercise and maybe exercise vigorously. Like, you need to have that there. The only way to get someone out of V-fib, right, is to defibrillate them. If you don't have an AED, you're, you're, you're putting your patients and your license at risk. So have one. It's an investment. It's something you, you, we got to have in every clinic. And making sure that you, know, you have you know, access um, for ad lib, uh, water and electrolytes, um, and a climate control facility. Again, knowing what we know about uh, rehydration strategies and temperature um, you know, influences on heart rate responses. So uh, that is sport cardiology for this uh, course. Um, again, we could dive deeper into these topics here, but just an introduction to some of these things that you, you probably need to be aware of if you're going to want to work with athletes.